My name is Valentina Esker-Price. I'm a professor in biostatistics and bioinformatics working in the Division of Neuroscience and Mental Health at Cardiff University and in the UK Dementia Research Institute. Polygenic risk scores are now widely used by the genetic research community for assessing the disease risk, assessing its prediction accuracy, and for identifying actual individuals at high and low disease risk. Today, I will talk about specifics and challenges of polygenic risk score calculation and interpretation in disorders associated with older age. Uh, dementia is uh, defined as a set of symptoms associated with changes in brain function that interfere with the ability to do everyday activities. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia and accounts for about 50-75% of all dementia cases. Uh, there are other diseases uh, associated with dementia, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal dementia, and in fact, rare diseases like Huntington disease, uh, which can lead to develop dementia-like symptoms. Uh, so I will be focusing today on Alzheimer's disease because it, as I said, it's most common and there is a good, powerful genome-wide association studies being conducted for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is a progressive condition, which means that clinical features develop gradually over many years before diagnosis. And the ability to predict disease risk before disease onset is really of great importance for studying people for clinical trials, for stratifying people for clinical trials, for selection of candidates for functional um, experimental studies. However, there is a number of challenges of studying disorders of aging. Focusing again on Alzheimer's disease, firstly, 30% of clinically diagnosed AD cases have no uh, neuropathological or biomarker characteristics. Uh, in addition, controls, if the controls uh, are younger than cases, which is quite common case now when we use population-based controls, 30% will become cases given time. In addition, 35% uh, of uh, lifetime risk of dementia is modifiable. For example, nutrition, uh, good health care, managing va vascular aspects, education may modify the lifetime risk of dementia and delay the age of onset. This potentially has led to decreased incidence of dementia over the last decades. So that actually adds to the problem with controls uh, if they are not age matched, even if they are age matched. With the availability of large population samples, like for example, UK Biobank, the use of population-based controls become a common practice to boost the statistical power. And for other uh, common uh, genetic disorders, like uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, like schizophrenia, Population controls are okay to use as the disease is rare, about 2% prevalence, and also manifests early in life. So we know that penetrance uh, of uh, the phenotype is mostly complete for schizophrenia at about 40 years of age, while, for example, for Alzheimer's disease, even at 80 years old, there are still individuals at risk who have not yet developed the Alzheimer's disease. Before moving on to the polygenic risk score, let's sh sh briefly uh, discuss heritability of Alzheimer's disease. As I mentioned before, 35% are modifiable or environmental, and between 58 and 79% is the genetic uh, ac accounts for genetic heritability. This is a broad sense heritability estimated in twin studies. Looking now at only genetic part, uh, so there is one, less than 1% heritability attributed to familial early onset Alzheimer's disease. APOE is a very interesting uh, locus or, or gene. Uh, APOE E4 allele is a strong common risk factor for Alzheimer's disease known already for decades, also associated with early onset 
and in fact to other conditions and consequently with shorter lifespan. Individuals carrying APOE E3-3 alleles, E3 is a neutral allele, still develop Alzheimer's disease. So what we know about APOE locus, it accounts between five and 9% uh, of heritability. So we have also other genome-wide significant loss, which accounts for three to 8% heritability and all the rest we have of, uh, for other um, SNPs, which were assessed by genome-wide association studies. So SNP-based heritability is uh, gray, green, uh, dark green color corresponds to SNP-based heritability, narrow sense heritability. And also there is about 14% of other genetic variation, which are attributed to rare variants, to potential interaction or epistatic, uh, epistatic effect between uh, SNPs, uh, copy number variant, and everything else which we have not discovered and accounted for yet. Nevertheless, uh, looking at genome-wide association studies for Alzheimer's disease, the largest, the first largest genome-wide association study uh, combining 74,000 uh, individuals was published in 2014. And uh, what we did uh, after that study was published, we looked at um, uh, SNPs not only at genome-wide significance level, but above the genome-wide significance level. So what we did, using GWAS summary statistics, we split SNPs into bins defined by the p-values. For example, the first line here talks about SNPs with p-values between, well, 0 and 10 to minus 7. Uh, it was 1,200 SNPs. Then based upon LD between these SNPs, we identified the number of independent SNPs among these 1,200, 738. Uh, under the null hypothesis, we also calculated the number of expected SNPs, significant SNPs in this bin, which was less than one, and looked at the ratio between observed and expected SNPs, which was high for genome-wide significant SNPs and highly significant. We've done it also for the other SNP uh, threshold bins, and what we observed that the ratio remained greater than one uh, at up to the p-value threshold 0.5. Well, of course, we adjusted for genomic control prior to this analysis. So to check uh, whether this effect is attributed to genome-wide associated we'll say, we have excluded SNPs and SNPs in OD with those which are genome-wide significant. So definitely in this bin, the number of uh, uh, SNPs dropped to two, independent SNPs, so the expected one is 0 0.37 or smaller than one. The ratio is 3.5 dropped and p-value was non-significant. However, when we move down, uh, uh, down the, or up with the p-value thresholds, again, we observed exactly the same effects. The uh, ratio estimated independent SNPs to expected was greater than one and highly statistically significant. This inspired us to look at the polygenic uh, risk component. So before I move on, polygenic risk, as you know, is defined as accumulation of risk alleles, which uh, an individual I carries. Each SNP contribution is uh, weighted by the SNP effect size obtained from an independent study. So what we would like to see, we know that polygenic risk scores are uh, normally distributed, we would like to see a clear separation of polygenic risk score in cases which are blue here and controls. In reality, these two distributions are overlapping a lot. However, for Alzheimer's disease, or in our sample, we observed relatively good separation. They are overlapping, but still separate. Um, so white are cases here and gray are controls. And that uh, was achieved at p-value threshold for SNPs inclusion 0.5. So that's table which demonstrates or uh, accompanies the picture from the free previous slide. So when we looked at E4 alleles only and predicted uh, case control status, the area under the curve or the accuracy of the prediction in our sample was about 68%. When we included E2 uh, genotypes, so it's slightly increased, when we included 20 at that time genome-wide significant, non-genome-wide significant SNPs, the accuracy increased to 
And then we started including SNPs at more liberal um, uh, p-value thresholds, and the best uh, accuracy has been achieved at 75% at the end of the curve, and it was highly significant over and above uh, APOE and genome-wide uh, associated locus loci known at that time. We also looked at maximal um, uh, prediction accuracy, which can be achieved in our study. For that, uh, the uh, heritability, narrow sense heritability has been estimated and published 24%. And using also uh, a lifetime prevalence 2%, we could estimate the maximal um, area under the curve which could be achieved um, in to predict AD cases and controls. So that's a, a calculation we have taken from Ray et al. paper 2010. And what we observed looking at all SNPs, uh, uh, capturing 24% of narrow sense heritability, we can achieve accuracy up to 82%. In the previous slide, I have shown you that in practice we achieved 75%. So we are relatively close to the maximum in our sample. When we looked at upper region alone, the uh, heritability captured by the upper region is about 5%. And based upon the same par parameters uh, uh, of 2% of eye prevalence, it's 65% accuracy uh, maximal, which we can achieve with APOE genotypes or genotypes from APOE locus, which was approximately the same as I've shown you before. When we include genome-wide significant loss, the accuracy only slightly increased. So polygenic risk score, uh, which is capturing uh, AD risk across the whole genome, does not work uniformly well in all data sets. For example, we have shown uh, that uh, it, in our study, it worked for SNPs with AD association at a liberal p-value threshold, 0 0.5. And recently, we have shown that 0 0.1 is probably the better one because the genome-wide association study have, uh, are now larger than the one which published in 2014. And we also shown that it's improved AD prediction over and above the genome-wide significant or suggestive SNPs. Whereas others have shown different p-value thresholds for SNP selection. In particular, people were thinking of including only genome-wide significant SNPs or SNPs which are significant at 10 to minus 5 significance level. This could be explained potentially by specifics of the data sets, including age of the participants, uh, clinical or pathological assessments of cases and controls, etc. So uh, in this paper, which appeared in 2020, also suggested that in, according to their uh, findings, that the potentially Alzheimer's disease is an oligogenic model, which means that includes only genome-wide significant SNPs or SNPs which are 10 to minus 5, I just said. Having in mind that the cases and controls uh, which where we have calculated and the CSPRS were age matched in one study or past confirmed in another study, whereas in the most recent studies, uh, uh, the cases and controls were, in, well, controls were including population-based uh, controls, younger and not screened, and in some studies, cases were defined via the family history, or so, well known as UK biobank proxies, which means that people were uh, included as cases if their parents had uh, uh, any type of dementia, of course. Uh, so looking then at what potentially could go on, why we see these different results, I decided to look at the, to start with uh, apoyalio frequencies, depending on age. Perhaps age component here, uh, uh, differences in age of cases and controls and between studies may explain this. So looking at uh, publication in 2011, we can see that APOE allele frequency goes down with age from uh, about 18% to about 8%. Uh, uh, frequency of E2 allele pretty much remains the same and the frequency of E33 goes up with age. Also, it is known that uh, APOE4 allele associated with uh, age at onset. So 91% of homozygous E4, E4 carriers will in average develop Alzheimer's disease in 68 years, when they're 68 years old. Non-carriers in average 20, uh, will uh, uh, develop the disease when they're 40, uh, sorry, 
84 years old. So 16 years difference between age and onset of E4-4 carriers and non-carriers. Therefore, potentially aging should be or need to be uh, accounted for when we calculate polygenic risk score and when we talk or take effect sizes from G genome wide association studies. So uh, what we've done next, we had an independent sample of two, uh, two, about 300 cases and 300 controls from ADNI and ADMP uh, studies. Uh, that is sample size is so small because we excluded all overlapping individuals with the summary statistics published by Kanko et al. 2019. And we looked in the whole sample at distribution of uh, allele frequency uh, with age. So an x-axis is age. So the green one is E, uh, E2 frequency, it doesn't change, similar as we've seen in the previous picture from, from the literature. E4 frequency goes down with age, again, similar what we've seen before, and E3 frequency goes up with age. Then we looked at cases and controls, E4 allele frequencies, which are in red, and also at oligogenic component, we exclude in APOE, and polygenic uh, component, excluding APOE. So then what we see in cases, the oligogenic component basically mimics the behavior of uh, APOE allele frequencies, whereas polygenic component goes up with age. Whereas in controls, uh, basically I would say that they don't really statistically different polygenic and oligogenic, and they don't change too much over time. From this picture, if we select sample young, you can see that uh, polygenic risk score could substantially differ as if we select a sample of age much older where polygenic risk score is higher in cases and lower in controls. Potentially that could uh, explain one of the explanations, one of many explanations why we observe different results in different studies with different age distributions. How to account for it? Uh, what we've done uh, in this uh, smaller sample, 300 cases, 300 controls, we used just standard methodology, climbing uh, LD pruning and thresholding approach, and looked at polygenic risk score as it would be calculated uh, uh, typically. And then we looked at APOE prediction uh, accuracy, which was 70%, two alleles, E4 plus E2. Then we included uh, the uh, genome wide significant loss rate. And that would well, remain the same accuracy. And then we started including uh, SNPs, small SNPs, the accuracy went down, exactly what our colleagues uh, observe when they calculate polygenic risk score as one score. When we excluded APOE locus, the accuracy uh, with uh, genome wide significant loss by about 56% and was increasing up to 0.1 p value threshold for SNP selection or inclusion. This observation made us think that perhaps if we model two components separately, polygenic risk or excluding APOE and APOE uh, uh, genotypes as two variables for prediction, that should work, and it worked indeed. And that's in fact how we uh, calculated it in our original paper without thinking much about age. At that time, it's just simply reviewers were asking us to uh, see if we observe a significant enrichment or improvement of prediction accuracy when we include uh, polygenic risk score over and above APOE, just by the way. Um, so again, starting with 70%, the overall accuracy uh, of uh, prediction of AD status in this small sample increased up to 74%. In fact, I have also managed to simulate this scenario just to confirm that our observations are correct. What I've done, I've simulated 10,000 cases and 10,000 controls. And from controls, assuming that they are population-based controls, I just uh, estimated that 91% of E4, E4 carriers will be cased at 68, 47, and 76, and 20 at age 84, looking at the previous um, studies. And I estimated about a third of them will be cases if they reach age 85. And then I have simulated uh, the... Uh, APOE with frequencies as in the real studies. 
Then I've taken uh, effect sizes and allele frequencies for another 39 genome-wide significance SNPs, which we are published in uh, recent reviews by Andrews and Allen 2020. And they simulated 10,000 independent SNPs with minor allele frequency and effect sizes matching in the genome-wide uh, asso association studies. I looked at the uh, uh, R squared variance explained and prediction accuracy basically the same, but in different units on the y axis. So, upper year alone, the prediction accuracy was 64.5%. Um, oligogenic risk score, uh, including SNPs, which are 10 to minus 5 significant, is um, would be slightly better, 60, uh, about seven, uh, 68 or so. Then, PRS full. Uh, PRS calculated, including Apoya as a part of the PRS, as would be normally calculate, have shown decreased accuracy. And R squared is also decreased. You can see it better here. But when we uh, calculated the prediction based upon two components, um, APOE plus PRS, no APOE separately, you can see the best prediction in terms of area under the curve and in terms of R squared. So uh, it is important to model perhaps uh, to take, have in mind the specific disease architecture uh, and model the effects appropriately. The next what we have looked at are different methodologies to calculate polygenic risk score. So far I was talking about standard pruning and thresholding, but we know that there are a number of other approaches to do so. So the first one, uh, we include PRECISE, which is a software implementation of simple pruning and thresholding method. So that is just when we done it manually. The second bar is using PRECISE. The next one we used uh, uh, LDPRED. It's a Bayesian approach which infers the posterior mean effect size of each SNP based on uh, SNP effect sizes and of correlated SNPs. And in fact, we use here LDPRED infinitesimal model, which is optimized for polygenicity parameter. We used uh, next one PRSCS, again Bayesian approach, which uses a continuous uh, shrinkage prior on sleep effects. And the OD estimates are taken from 10,000 uh, genomes here. So we might lose some SNPs here when we uh, look at, uh, at the prediction accuracy. Uh, S by SR, it's just approach which really scales SNP effect sizes. Uh, this is bias. Ah, uh, this one. Uh, uh, no, Inspire sites a Bayesian approach, which it is scales SNP effect sizes using Bayesian multiple regression. Uh, and then LDAC is another methodology uh, which adjusts SNP effect sizes for local OD by reducing the contribution of SNPs in regions of high OD. So there are different methodologies available, and we tested them all, and we looked at the extremes, uh, individuals at the extremes. Because although all approaches have shown similar accuracy, if you look at AUC here, pretty much similar, we can always see that when we uh, um, uh, model AD, uh, PRS AD, which means that APOE is modeled separately, in addition to PRS without AD, it predicts, it's, uh, predicts the best in our sample. But nevertheless, they all have shown similar accuracy. The next question is, do PRS variable uh, the next question is, do PRS calculated with different methodologies agree, at least at the extremes of the PRS distributions? So here we looked at the PRS distribution with pruning and thresholding. We have taken extremes negative and positive and followed them up uh, uh, looking at different other methodologies. And in some individuals are indeed remain the same. And this is a, I, I might tell you that it's a E44 carriers, they remain the same. But some individuals, in fact, end up in the middle of the distribution. So the conclusion here is uh, that the choice of PRS calculation methodology may lead to identification of different sets of individuals with high and low uh, extremes at the distribution curve. The next problem is, is age. Recently, two well-powered GVASs on longevity have clearly demonstrated that uh, longevity is a genetic trait. We also know that the most popular approach to correct for differential, differential age distribution and cases and controls is to adjust for age when running, running a DSNP association analysis. However, as it's shown in um, uh, this paper, Ashhad et al., so adjusting for heritable covariates 
can introduce bias in the effect size estimates. And that's important difference between environmental and demographic factors, which we use for the adjustment, and heritable human traits, uh, which we use for the adjustment. And that um, made me think about potential collider bias. Inspired by this um, paper de et al, uh, they have showed that the inclusion uh, of height as a covariate created a robust but biologically spurious association between sex and heat associated variance. So I thought about this and simulated similar, simulated, similar situation uh, for AD. Consider the case when um, uh, Alzheimer's disease and the SNP both associated with age, but Alzheimer's disease is not associated with the SNP. Right, so that's my simulation design. So I simulated uh, 5,000 cases, let's say mean age 78, and 5,000 controls. And I have varied uh, age of the controls 74, 70, and 65, just drawn from a normal distribution. And I simulated, as I said, uh, SNP and age association. See, it's significant everywhere. Also, AD is associated with age, significant highly everywhere. And the ID and SNP are not associated. So p-value here is 0 0.5 approximately. And when I calculated association of SNP to Alzheimer's disease adjusting for age, when the age distribution was relatively similar, 78 and 74, a SNP has shown a spurious but not so strong association. And when the difference in, in ages in cases and controls became higher, the association became stronger. I'm not saying that all SNPs are like this but there might be SNPs in the genome-wide significant studies which show spurious association with Alzheimer's disease whilst being associated rather with age. So in conclusion, why increasing effect size of genome-wide association studies led to identification of more loci, it has also involved the use of non-AD cases, and even more so um, in proxy uh, case series, and this is having a detrimental, it might have a detrimental effect on PRS prediction of cases. Second, allelic variation at the APOE locus impacts survival by both altering the age at the set of AD and by increasing uh, risk of other conditions, and also by the fact that the frequency of APOE E4 in a population uh, corresponds accordingly goes down with age. Looking at different methodologies, comparing six PRS calculation methodologies, we conclude that the prediction accuracies are very similar. However, the individual scores uh, may differ. Uh, another conclusion is that we need to have a clear distinction. Uh, what do we calculate polygenic risk scores? What's the purpose of our study? So if ADPRS could be useful to identify, uh, identify individuals at high risk, the accuracy of the current methods, perhaps, is not as good to use it in clinic. And also, if it's used in clinic, when it's used in clinic, we should really carefully, uh, should be really careful at explaining to the public what polygenic risk score means. In terms of uh, using the polygenic risk score to identify in extremes for biological studies, for functional studies, at the moment, I prefer to use the simplest one because the biologist asked me a simple question, which exactly SNPs and with which effect sizes contribute to the polygenic risk score. The Bayesian approaches may, um, because it uses prior information and calculations, may mask, and uh, it's not easily explainable, at least at the moment. And that is my presentation. I would like to um, acknowledge the funders, the Dementia Research Institute, the Dementia Platforms, UK Medical Research Council, uh, Alzheimer's Research Society and uh, Alzheimer's Research Association and JPND, a European funding body. And of course, my team who inspired me to work on this topic and explain unexplainable effects.